I'm, I'm actually, before I get to journalism, I'm going to start with a confession, and I apologize in advance to the academics in, in the room, but when I was at Carleton, and I took journalism at Carleton back in the late 70s, early 80s, and I did a minor in economics, which turned out to be a very good thing because I went on to cover business, but at the time, uh, I took a, a number of economics courses, and one of them was Canadian economic history, and it was a terrific prof. He was a really nice guy, but it was in the evening. It was in an old 1970s building with no air, and I could not stay awake in the class. And uh, so it, it just goes to show you never know what students are going to do what in the future, even though I dozed off in his class. I wish I hadn't. Uh, I've, I've gone on to be fascinated by Canadian business history and, and have written about it extensively as, as Gord has, not as extensively as you, but uh, somewhat. And, um, you know, I think, um, let, let me start with uh, a little bit of the history of business journalism in Canada, because that will help contextualize where we are now, which I don't think is a good place, and I think probably Gord would agree with that. Uh, the, the, the withering of, of journalism and, and business journalism in particular uh, over the last 10 years really since the advent of this thing and, and other devices. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, it was, was it 1963 when the report on business was established, the Global Mail, early 60s? Uh, it might have been as a separate, as a separate entity. Maybe separate entity? Section. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which is not that long ago, given that we're talking about the sesquicentennial of, of Canadian business history here. So, you know, 54 years ago. And you know, when I go to speak to journalism students, which is becoming less and less frequent, I have to tell you, because of the diminishing state of, of journalism, or the diminished state of journalism, uh, I often talk about how Business journalism is a relatively recent phenomenon in the, you know, the, the galaxy of journalism. Uh, you know, we talk about the Globe in the early 60s. CBC didn't really cover business until the mid-80s. I started to work for a business show there called Venture, which was, uh, I think, truthfully, it was a sock to the conservative government of Brian Mulroney at the time, which did not like the CBC. And Patrick Watson was the first host of Venture for the first two years. Oh, we'll do a business show. We'll do a half hour a week, and that'll, you know, we'll check that box off. And it actually turned out to be a very popular and successful program, which I think coincided with the zeitgeist of the time. It, it followed on a terrible recession in the early 80s, 1982, when a lot of people were first hearing the word restructuring. Boomers were buying their first home or buying their first stock and, and so forth. As people started to think about business and thought business news, business journalism is maybe important to my life because it's the economy and, and, and how I make a living and among other things how I send my kids to school uh, after they graduate from high school and so forth. And when I talk to these kids in, in journalism school, I say, because m I have a theory that most journalism students go there because they like words. They're bad in math. <laughs> and so, okay, I'm going to go do something where I can write and, and I can avoid all those numbers. And they're making a big mistake because uh, business journalism is not so much about numbers. I mean, they're important. You have to have some sort of understanding. But like Ward said, they're about the themes. They're about the people. They're about the cycles, the, the stories within these companies. Those are the kinds of things which make business journalism come alive, at least for me and I think for you. And, and I hope for the readers and consumers of that news. So what I say to them is, you know, there are a couple of major forces in the world that drive news coverage. And, or drive policy, and this was coming up in the earlier discussion with we'll Quebec this morning. And, and, I, and I tell them to think about it like a barbell. On one barbell, there's business and the economies of the world, and the other barbell is politics. And there's this constant kind of recalibration of the two. Prior to the financial crisis, I would argue, 
the, you know, the business side of the barbell was a little too heavy, got out of control. And then the political side of the barbell had to come in and, you know, bail out GM, bail out Chrysler, you know, whatever, TARP in the United States, ABCP here. Uh, you know, public officials had to get a handle on what this side of the barbell had, you know, led us to. Uh, and I guess you could make the argument that there's a third barbell in certain parts of the world religion, which, which impacts uh, the situation enormously. So, uh, you know, I try to, to impress upon them that business journalism, business news, is important. And if they want to have a career in journalism, in, a, in the diminished world of journalism, perhaps the business area is an area to to focus their attention on because it's, it's, it's pretty important. And in recent years, it, it developed a bit more heft and a bit more sense of importance that, hey, this is front page news. This isn't just business section news. This is front page news. And unfortunately, it's all coming crashing down. I mean, when you pick up your Globe and Mail or your uh, National Post in the morning, you can't help but remark, if you still pick it up, that it's extraordinarily thin, notwithstanding what's available online, etc. It, it, there's less and less of it. BNN, which was a, a fairly recent, or is a fairly recent entry into this sphere, we went on the air September 1st, 1999. And uh, the application was actually came via the Globe and Mail because it was reported on business television initially. And I mean, you were probably in the newsroom when I was shooting the video down there in 96. It was part of the CRTC application for that. Went on the air in 99. And uh, the owners only gave us four months. They said, you've got four months to either make this work and catch on, or we're going to pull the plug at Christmas. That's, that was the extent of the commitment. And that was essentially Ken Thompson's commitment, because he was the 50% owner of BNN, or ROB TV at the time. And fortunately for us, the timing was great because the dot-com world was cresting. You know, Nortel was 35% of the TSE, the TSE then, now the TSX. Uh, RIM was, I remember the day I had Jim Dalsley on the show, the stock went from 60 to $80 that day. I don't know that it was exactly because of the interview that we did, but it was... How are you best to have <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and then, of course, all sorts of other things were happening. Jerry Schwartz was trying to buy Air Canada, and there was CP and American Airlines. There was a whole thing going on. Probably the best investment he'd never made, because uh, exactly, what was it, 16 years ago today? 9-11? The whole airline industry changed, I would argue, the life of Bombardier changed irrevocably as a result of that day. If you look at the stock chart of Bombardier, it has essentially never recovered from 9-11 and what happened to the aerospace industry. And all of these other things, and I think you raise a good point about the ownership and so forth, I think have, have, have uh, been, been part and parcel of, of what's happened and, and trying to deal with that. So uh, BNN was a very recent, or has been a very recent addition. It's only 18 years old uh, as of this month, but it too is diminished. At its peak, it probably had, I know it had, twice the number of people it has now. If you look back at the CRTC, these are public documents, I'm not talking about school. If you look at the public documents, the, the, the CRTC reporting on the channels, you will see how many people they had in 2012, 2013. You will see how many they have now, and it's half. And they're still doing essentially the same amount of programming every day. And you know, we felt like hamsters on the wheel would double the people. And I think they're like hamsters on steroids now. It's crazy to try to cover that. But the, and and I want to bring it to the coverage of business history because all of those sources, as as Gord indicated, so rightly, are kind of the initial seeds for a lot of what what we do. I mean, when I look at um, the um, the first two books that that I've written, and the third, actually, that I'm working on now, 
Each one of those has come out of the business coverage that I did as a business journalist. The TD Bank book came out of a venture story that I did on TD's discount brokerage division in 1996-97, which I think you worked on. You wrote a case study, Joe, right, uh, on Greenline. A lot of people have forgotten Greenline now, but uh, getting to know about Greenline, the discount brokerage business, which was TD's focus then, rather than buying an investment bank, like all of the other major banks at the time, it went, it went the other way and got 70, 75% market share in discount brokerage in creating a model based on Schwab. And a lot of people don't know, unless they've read this book or are familiar with what happened at the time or read Joe's case study, that that decision to develop that discount brokerage business is the basis for what you see at TD Bank today, the gigantic presence south of the border. Because they concentrated on that. They made a lot of money on it. At first, they didn't. At first, it was extraordinarily difficult. Uh, but they made enough to buy Waterhouse in 1996. Get this. The purchase price of Waterhouse, it was the biggest acquisition TD Bank ever, ever made. 1996, it was $715 million. They made two plus billion in a quarter now. That, and they were nervous. Jeez, we're going to screw this up, you know? We got this blue chip bank, so we're number five, you know? Okay, we do okay, we pay the dividend everywhere. They bought it. They basically got it for free. If you read the book, which you can get cheap on Amazon now, you, you, you'll find out why they got it for free. And it also, they IPO'd it in 99, 2000 with the dot-com thing and got a billion two or something on the, it was real money back then, a billion dollars. And they had cash in their jeans. When Paul Martin rejected the bank mergers, Charlie Bailey went to Ottawa and said, hey, what about Canada Trust? You, you make a fuss if we buy Canada Trust? No, you're the smallest, you can buy that. Okay, they were the only one, because Amasco would only take cash. And they had the cash from the odd deal. So that, that started to get me thinking about a story I got to know Keith Gray, who was the guy who built Greenline, amazing executive, high school dropout from southwestern Ontario, built the business, then he retired. Charlie bought Canada Trust, which an, an incredibly smart purchase, really, because it changed the DNA of the bank, turned it more into a, a retail bank, and also brought in a guy named Ed Clark, who we now see is trying to get Amazon to come to, <laughs> to Toronto. Uh, and, and that created the platform whereby Ed could go and start to buy banks in the United States. And now you see TD Ameritrade, which is a $20 billion company or something like that, and it came out of Greenland. That's a separate thing that TD has 45% of. So th there was a story there, and, and, and it, it had its roots going way back into you know, the 50s, really, when this guy Gray started the bank. So the coverage, for me, the coverage of that in 96, 97, led to me covering the bank over time, getting to know people like Charlie Bailey, Ed Clark, and then Dick Thompson, who was their predecessor, and putting it all together in a, in a, in a book form. And with the Bronfman story, uh, Charles Bronfman's memoir, again, that came out of coverage at BNN. He was a guest on the show. We had never had one of the, what I call, big problems on the program. And uh, uh, I guess it was 2012, the fall of 2012, uh, one of our producers on the show said, well, Charles Bronfman's will come on the program. Great. We were doing half-hour interviews on Headline at the time. He had just joined the Bill Gates um, Warren Buffett giving pledge, whereby billionaires pledge half their their dough to uh, charitable causes, uh, philanthropic causes upon their death. And so I said, great, let's have him on. But we can't just have him on on philanthropy. That's great. I'll honor that. We'll do two segments on that. It's very interesting. But 
there's a big elephant in the room. Seagram went poof in 2000. There's probably 99% of the students at Rotman have never heard of Seagram now. And that's 17 years ago. So I'm not saying they should have, but it's just the way things are. And I said, you know, we, we covered that story, but we never had one of the principals on. And so I, I'll be polite about it, but I want to ask him about it. And so I did. Uh, we did the first two segments on, on philanthropy. And then in the third segment, I said, you know, I have to ask you, and I, with the greatest respect, because I know this is sensitive, but that's a long time ago now, too. It's 12 years ago. I'm just curious to know what you think after all this time. And he was ready. He was ripe to talk publicly. And he said, I feel now the same way I did then. It's a terrible tragedy for the family. It was our, it was our, uh, it was our DNA. We lost our identity, shareholders lost money, employees lost, and, and then I said to him, well, do you talk to your nephew much? He said, not much. <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's almost like I've never heard anything quite as raw. And then I said, well, what would your dad think after all this time? He said, and then he started to tear up. And I mean, he didn't lose it, but I could see that it was extremely emotional for him. And he was in his early 80s at the time. And then, uh, you know, uh, I left BNN in uh, early June 14, and then at the end of uh, July of 2014, I got a LinkedIn message from this guy in the white shirt, Tony Wilson Smith, who said in this LinkedIn message, a prominent Canadian, an eminent Canadian, would like to speak with you this afternoon. Uh, what's your cell number? So uh, I wrote back, and, uh, and Charles Bronkman called me at 5 o'clock on a Friday afternoon and said, how would you like to write my, uh, my biography, my memoir? So it kind of took off from there. And uh, I owe Tony thanks forever for that one. <laughs> Great book. <part. laughs> Thank you. And, and, you know, and now I'm working on the one on Hunter, and, uh, you know, that's, you know, I think an amazing incredible story on so many levels. And again, it, it, it was the result of news coverage because I got to know him first when he was running CN, stayed in touch through that interlude period when he was off at the horse farm before Bill Ackman called him to pull what they did at CP, and now he's at CSX. So it's quite incredible, and, I, and it's so important to have those early situations, that early coverage of these, of, of these instances and stories to build the bigger stories. I mean, uh, it's actually a pretty small, incestuous world when you think about it. You know, can, Canadian business is tiny. Everybody knows everybody. All the journalists know each other. I mean, uh, Gord in his book on Purdy quoted my TD book, because Purdy was in there as a mentor to Ed, and I'm going through the research for Hunter Harrison, who do I find articles by, Gord Pitts, you know, so it, it, it's, it's a very small uh, ecosystem, and it's getting smaller, sadly, and I think that's bad for everybody here. A, we want to know what's going on. It's not that media get it right every time. We know that, but it's a start, and without it, it's a vacuum. And that's bad for everybody, I think. And I can give you what I consider to be a shocking example of where we've been headed. And this actually goes back eight years to 2009. But I think it's gotten much more, uh, much more, uh, what's the word, acute since then. It, it, at Davos, the World Economic Forum in 2008, uh, I interviewed Pierre Baudouin of Bombardier. And a few years before, I had, I had worked for about four years on Swiss Air 111, the investigation of Swiss Air 111. And, uh, you know, that was about putting together two million pieces of a broken aircraft and trying to figure out what had happened, which they did. And I thought, okay, Pierre, you have decided now, after 
having decided previously not to build the C-Series, now you're going to build the C-Series. And probably next to the oil sands, the construction of the oil sands, the C-Series is one of the biggest industrial projects this country has ever undertaken. Multiple billions of dollars. And not just in Canada, but in Shenyang, where they build the fuselage, and in, in uh, Belfast, where they build the wings, and Pratt & Whitney in Connecticut for the engines and so forth. Multi country project, uh, very complex, etc. And I thought, this would make a fascinating film, the making of the C-Series. Swiss Air 111 was putting together all those pieces, you know, the broken pieces. This is putting together all the new pieces, and the end of the film would be the first test flight of the C-Series. Now, notwithstanding that I might have been making the film for eight years, uh, instead of four or five, uh, Discovery Channel, I had a partner in Vancouver, a uh, documentary maker with a company there, and uh, Discovery Channel gave us development money. So I went and I shot three or four days. I, you know, I spoke with Pierre. They were into it. We developed an agreement whereby, whereby we would get access over this period of four years and we'd, we'd watch this thing come together. And I just this fascinating film and a, a documenting of this process and, and uh, something for the world to see. So I shot for three or four days at Bombardier in Montreal. I flew the C-Series simulator and uh, even landed it, although it would have been a, you know, one where everybody reached for the bag, I think. Uh, and we put together probably an eight, nine minute trailer, and then we went back to Discover. And then they said, no, we're not going to do it. And okay, it was in the wake of the crisis, everybody was scared and so forth. But it wasn't that. Something had changed in the media landscape. Something bad had happened, in my view. The, what we heard back from the people who make the decisions this was the Discovery Channel, was that the characters, i.e. the engineers at Bombardier, the people doing this, what was really fascinating work, and they were articulate people, the characters aren't extreme enough. I mean, that's appalling, really. And then we took it to CBC, and CBC said that too. I think it was a huge mistake on both their parts. You know, it would have been a terrific film, and, and uh, uh, but but now here we are, eight years later, and in 2009 when that happened, who could envision Facebook? Who could envision Twitter, Snapchat? I mean, that's not what's going to help Gordon and I write books, and it's also. The book world is becoming more and more difficult as well. It's not just the daily media, but the publishing industry. I mean, you look at Canada, you've got HarperCollins, and then you've got Random House, but McClellan Stewart is part of Random House, and Penguin's part of Random House. So there's three that are part of Random House. So you really have two big publishers. And, and uh, they're being squeezed. You need really big names now. So think Steve Jobs and Walter Isaacson. Those are the blockbuster books. You know, uh, Michael um, Corda, who was editor at Simon, Simon Schuster for 30 years, and a wonderful writer himself, uh, wrote a book about the publishing industry a number of years ago, a terrific book called Another Life. And he, he makes fun of new management that comes in and says, well, we have changed our policy here. We're only going to publish bestsellers. So who the hell knows what a bestseller is going to be? But, but that's what they want to do now. And they don't know. They don't know what's going to sell. But they think they've got to have the biggest names. They've got to have authors with platforms. You know, so you're going to see a lot of books by Kevin O'Leary. You know, uh, and uh, you can tell me whether you think that's good or bad. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, in terms of subjects now, 
you know, you mentioned Bombardier. I mentioned Bombardier. I think there's a great book in Bombardier for somebody. I don't know that it's me. I think there, there's a great book in the Thompson family, perhaps. Interesting. Family company, not dual class shares. Private, private essentially. Right. right. Yeah, private companies are becoming more folk. Yeah. I think what's more emphasis on the need for reporters if you take it. Right. For journalism, because it's not something you'll see in the, in the public uh, yeah. in the public analysis. Well, the Seagram was, was similar in a way. I mean, it was not dual class shares, but it was 36% uh, owned, I think, at the height by the Bronfman family. So it was was control. Uh, so, you know, I think there, there, there are great books out there to, uh, still to be written. Um, you know, if, if uh, Ontario manages to snag Amazon, there's, you know, there's a book there. I think there are case studies to be written. I think there should be a case study written about the Seagram situation. I think Rotman's a perfect place to do it. Uh, they've done the TD Bank one. I know Harvard Business School is doing the Pershing Square CP Rail one. Uh, I don't know of a Canadian business school that's doing that one, but it would seem appropriate to me that a, a Canadian business school tackle that. Uh, and, and, you know, I also wonder uh, whether, uh, you know, because of the difficult, and this is a, a question that I throw out to you, uh, given the difficulties that authors are going to have getting books published in this country on Canadian business history, whether business schools should be playing more of a role in that. I, I, I don't know, but I, I toss it out for, for discussion. 